Um, thank you, Alice, for the introduction. Thank you all for coming. Um, so in particular, I want to acknowledge again the Department of African American Studies with appreciation at UIC and the Institute for Research on Race and Public Policy. Um, the two centers at the University of Chicago, the Center for the Study of Race, Politics, and Culture, and the Center for the Study of Gender and Sexuality were major partners uh, in this event. And the Public Square and Experimental Station are just outstanding places. Um, they're places and people where we can come together and have discussions like this. And so this wonderful space and the wonderful work of um, the Public Square kind of made it all possible. There are particular people, Alice uh, Kim, Rachel Kydor, uh, Tracy Matthews, um, Gina Olson, Michael Dawson, Linda Zarilli, uh, lots of people worked hard to make it happen. The students are doing a great job making it uh, continue to happen. Um, so thank you. I particularly feel like standing kind of in this space, many of you like me have been here before, where we're kind of interested in opening up conversations. This space feels really important to me in part because of the physical space and it's on the south side, but also because it's full of so many people here who are uh, anti-prison activists and advocates activists in the work to end violence against women. And so I stand here in this space uh, excited about this dialogue. I'm grateful for all of your work. But more importantly, I'm grateful for this space. In fact, I feel like I've waited 30 years for this space and these people to have this discussion. I continue to find myself in too few places where people who are doing radical anti-racist politics, challenging white supremacy, ignore questions of feminism. Uh, many discussions that I find myself in working against uh, the carceral state, working for penal abolition, ignore issues of women, don't talk about the importance of queer mobilization. Um, I yearned for years for the opportunity to have this discussion, and that's in great part why I wrote Arrested Justice. So Arrested Justice is a book with three themes, three kind of major storylines. The first is kind of a personal uh, political history, if you will, about my journey as a feminist activist working to end violence against women. That violence, which many of you know in this room, is a huge, huge problem, continues to be with catastrophic consequences health consequences, mental health consequences, emotional consequences, economic consequences, political consequences, including the way that it limits women's ability to be part of our mobilizing in these important uh, critical times. In Arrested Justice, I focus on those black women whose experiences um, sort of in, engage the more serious consequences of violence. And the consequences that I'm talking about are those that are made more serious because of the multiple forms of abuse that black women experience. Because in our communities, the response to abuse uh, is either to deny it or to blame women for it. And consequences that are made worse because of oppressive, oppressive social conditions in our communities, particularly structural racism and class domination. Indeed, sexual assault and stalking, battering, forced sex work, emotional manipulation, denial of medical tr treatment, on and on, are made worse by the way that communities respond given social arrangements that punish black women. And that's the part about a prison nation. It's like the impact of the abuse that I talked about is extended or uh, it gets a booster, if you will, from conditions in communities that disadvantage black women in society. That um, is what led me over 25 years ago to organize with a group of women of color in Harlem to set up one of the first community-based anti-violence programs uh, in New York City. And I talk about the evolution of that program in the book. We were working at that time in Harlem, which most of you know is a black, uh, predominantly black and Latino community in New York City, um, renowned for its political commitments and activism, a place that led us, perhaps naively, to expect that our community 
would be open to our feminist analysis and responses to gender-specific problems about community health and well-being. We were surprised, quite frankly, to find ourselves um, struggling, struggling seriously with community leadership who at the time actively resisted our attempts to intervene in what we thought were problematic politics around gender and sexuality. Then I uh, learned about the dynamic feminist activists in New York who were building a radical grassroots movement in response to the tyranny of violence against women. It was a powerful um, feminist analysis of gender inequality and it resonated quite deeply with those of us who were doing the work uh, in New York at the time. Except, of course, that the emerging feminist analysis at the time of violence against women did not adequately, in fact, it did not at all, incorporate an understanding of race or class inequality. Because at that time we were living with this tension um, as activists in our community, we were immediately drawn to a, nation, a nationwide effort of women of color that was both challenging dominant groups to relinquish their growing hold on the resource base that was beginning to influence the violence against women movement and the subsequent power that white feminists were using to define the work. Um, black feminist literature at that time deeply informed our work. We felt kind of a um, sense of high expectations, both of the anti-violence work, uh, the movement, and our communities. We felt as if we had found uh, a moment in time that was ripe for autonomous black feminist organizing that would both influence the work in our communities as well as the anti-violence work that was surrounding it. We thought that we could identify uh, key sort of natural, if you will, social justice allies, that they would welcome our analysis with enthusiasm. Instead, we found ourselves in constant battle with more mainstream groups all around us. There are lots of women of color who have done anti-violence work, uh, both in Chicago and in other places who I think this analysis would resonate with. Um, we heard over and over again about uh, the ways that gender inequality caused violence against women, almost to the exclusion of other factors. And on the other hand, we were engaged in discussions in our communities with male dominated, predominantly male dominated organizations who were actively rejecting the notion that gender inequality had anything to do with, any relevance at all to the racial justice work that they were engaged in, that we were engaged in. In the book, I detail this collective story, if you will, of kind of growing up as a social justice activist, working at the grassroots level, deeply informing my analysis by the work of survivors of gender violence. Um, that's the first story that I try to tell in uh, Arrested Justice, and you'll hear from the panelists, I think, uh, other women who shared uh, in that collective journey. That brings me to the second storyline in the book. The second storyline is about how the US-based anti-violence movement that I grew up in, the anti-rape, anti anti-domestic violence, and even the kind of more academic activist uh, work that tried to do principled, engaged research and do a kind of political writing that would inform movement organizing and that was responded to movement issues, how that work clashed or was sidetracked, was really run over by the simultaneous buildup of a prison nation. This second story is really about how anti-violence work um, that was dedicated uh, to not only responding to indiv individual women, but also trying to build bridges with struggle in communities of color, found ourselves right in the dangerous path, right in the dangerous path of a new political dynamic in this country, the buildup of a prison nation, and how the anti-violence movement really collapsed into it. The prison nation that I talk about in the book reflects a series of uh, neoliberal uh, ideological and political shifts that have led to increased criminalization in disadvantaged communities, more aggressive law enforcement strategies, a kind of undermining of civil and human rights of marginalized groups. A prison nation um, uses the power of the law, uses pu public policy, 
and institutional practices to systematically reinforce a set of hegemonic values that overpower individuals, especially those individuals who are struggling for change. The political apparatus that I talk about as the buildup of a prison nation in arrested justice includes things like increased in um, punishment for norm violations, things like becoming pregnant as an adolescent. Um, it includes things like institutional regulations designed to intimidate and uh, punish people, like in the case of welfare reform. Legislation that deliberately narrows uh, opportunities, English-only laws, for example, and schemes to build consensus around conservative values, like the pr uh, primacy of heterosexual nuclear families. A prison nation requires that leaders create kind of a culture of fear, uh, fear of terrorists or fear of health care reform, uh, that we identify scapegoats like immigrants or feminists, and reclassify people as uh, enemies of a stable society, people like prisoners, activists, hip-hop artists, and the like. Most intellectual and political responses to the buildup of a prison nation look at how these developments disadvantage men, particularly black men. Prison abolition work, therefore, doesn't necessarily bring a feminist analysis to it. It doesn't center the work on women. It doesn't look at what happens to queer people in a prison nation, and it doesn't attend to survivors of violence. Panelists uh, who will be invited soon to talk about that, their work, I hope will reflect on some of those ideas. Now, I want to say clearly, um, and I'll say it quickly, that um, I know that some of the aspects of a prison nation have benefited some women who experience male violence. Uh, to some extent, new laws made it possible for some women to be safe. That police respond aggressively means that some women are temporarily safe. The key here is that at the same time that there has been some progress made for some women, there's growing concern that propelled me to write Arrested Justice that women who are less powerful, who are less in the mainstream, who have been less attended to by that anti-violence movement, are in as much danger as ever. In fact, I argue in the book that they're in more danger precisely because of the ideologic and strategic direction that the anti-violence movement has taken during the buildup of a prison nation. And so that's the third storyline in the book. And in fact, that's the most important one to me. Those are the stories of women suffering of violence and the ways that the prison nation has made their experience of violence worse um, and how they survive despite it all. In some ways, that's the story that's hardest to tell in a setting like this with a short amount of time. But I do want to bring some of the real life of this into this space um, in order to give uh, some more direct meaning to some of the ideas that I'm talking about. So in the book, I talk about the story of Ms. B. Um, it's ironic in some ways that the, one of the last, most recent times I've been in this space was to celebrate uh, an occasion for Ms. B that I'll talk about in a moment. Ms. B was a resident of public housing in Chicago. She, her first encounter uh, with state violence was one evening when a group of uh, men, five undercover Chicago police officers, um, knocked on her door violently, pushed her into uh, a narrow hallway in her apartment, um, and pr made good on the promise that they had threatened her with, that they would never let her forget who she was. This was the latest in a series of violent attacks that could be traced back to an evening a few months earlier. She had lived in public housing for 27 years. Her uh, housing complex, Stateway Gardens, had been paradoxically targeted by the city's plan for transformation, which is, was the city's decision to tear down uh, public housing, not only to tear down the buildings, but to temporarily suspend public services in the area, to increase police surveillance of residents during this transition, to advance a public relations campaign that was somehow designed to convince homeowners that this change in their neighborhood, this widespread destruction of their housing would ultimately benefit them. 